Hey, Pastor Bobby here. I'm so glad you're joining us to hear what God is sharing with our community here at Chapel. And I pray, I am praying right now for you, that this message will bless you. It'll be an inspiration to you. It will challenge you to be who God has called you to be and to do what God has called you to do. Do. And so as we jump into the message, I pray that you open up your mind to God's Word, open up your heart to God's Spirit, and watch the two come together to bring a supernatural miracle in your life. So let's jump into what God is speaking to us right now. You. A lot of stuff going on right now. We have a team in Haiti. We have 17 people that are sharing the love of Jesus with our campus in Haiti. Uh, they went up the mountain, so we changed our approach. Used to we'd rent a truck and have a driver drive us up the side of this mountain. And I was joking with the people this morning in our pre-service prayer meeting, and it was basically a pickup truck with a roll cage on the back of it. We call it a cattle cage. And they put like 25 of us in the back of this truck in this cattle cage standing up. And you go up this mountain and it's like, there's no guardrails, there's no road, it's rocks. And that thing's teetering. I'm like, this is like a pre-made coffin if this thing was to flip over. And so they started doing motos. Motos are motorcycles. So they're putting three people at a time on motorcycles. They're all riding up this mountain. And it takes, cuts it in about 25% of the time. And so they went up there. They started painting yesterday. Started setting up the medical stuff. And they've just already just really connected with all the kids there. And what's really neat is those that sponsor kids are there with the kids they've sponsored. So they're actually bringing them back to their hotel tonight to spend time with them, feed them, let them play in the pool, that kind of thing. And all of you that sponsor kids, thank you for taking gifts and sending gifts down to Haiti. Uh, they'll get those tomorrow. And so it's going to be a really, really cool week for them there in Haiti. Next week, we start a brand new series called A River Runs Through It to start January because... Life is not something you control. Life is something that flows. If you've ever tried to control your life, you know as soon as you try to control it, it gets out of control. And that flow sometimes gets stagnant. It gets where it just doesn't seem like anything's moving forward. And sometimes it feels like it's flooding, like life just keeps flooding into your life and catastrophe and chaos and storms and all this stuff. And the problem is we try to learn how to change the flow or try to change the direction. We do that through New Year's resolutions. We do that through changing habits, et cetera. But you can't change the flow of your life. What you can do is get into the flow of God. Find out how God is flowing. Find out what God is doing. And then put your life in God's flow and watch him change everything else about you. So we're going to spend some time in January talking about that. And so it's going to be a good month. Here your Bibles turn to Daniel chapter 10. And we're going to be in verse 2. Daniel chapter 10, verse 2. As we talk about a pattern for breakthrough. Now, I don't know about you, but especially around the holidays, I get very hungry. So the kids are home more. The kids are home more means there's no food at the house. They eat. As soon as we go to the grocery store, put in the cabinets. As soon as I turn around, the cabinets are empty. Like they're chaos. And many times I just get hungry and hungry and hungry. And I'll start picking at whatever I can find to eat. Leftovers, snacks, Doritos, all this junk food. And what I've learned is there's not really, I'm not probably hungry but I want something to eat. And there's a difference between being hungry and wanting something to eat. And there's three different types of hunger. There's habitual hunger, which means you're, you want something to eat, even though your body's not actually hungry, you want something to eat based on certain triggers, whether that's a time on the clock, it's getting close to noon, so maybe you're getting hungry, or maybe it's 6 p.m., you're getting hungry. Maybe you turn on the football game and all of a sudden you want nachos and hot wings. It's habitual hunger meaning you've trained your body to want certain things at certain times. Then there's actual physical hunger, which is when your body actually needs food to survive. Scientists tell us that doesn't actually happen until 21 days after not eating, meaning your body has enough physical reserves, enough physical reserves to live off its own stuff for 21 days before you start actually getting hungry. Then you have spiritual hunger, Spiritual hunger is when you're hungry and you can't explain why, like deep in your soul, you're hungry for more. You're hungry for change. You're hungry for something. You're hungry for something different. Deuteronomy chapter 8 says it this way, and he humbled you. Now, this is the Israelites he's talking to that they came out of the desert or came out of Egypt. They're in the desert, walking around the wilderness. And he says, he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know Make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And what he's saying is, I'm trying to take you from one place to another. And you're so caught up in your own selfish desires and feeding your flesh and feeding your desires that you've lost sight that I am the one who feeds you. I am the one that satisfies your spirit. There's a spiritual hunger 
that feeds, that drives us to want more of God, or want things to change, or want prayers to be answered. And the problem is that many of us, our stomachs are full, our stomachs are satisfied, but our spirits are empty. We spend so much time feeding our flesh that we're depriving our spirit. And the problem with that is your spirit is where you actually need the most sustenance. The spirit is where your desires are met. That's where your contentment lies, your joy lies, your hope lies, your strength lies, your power lies. It's in your spirit, man. But we spend so much time and energy and resources and money focusing on our, building up our flesh that our spirits are dying and they're weak and they're hungry and they're thirsty. And my question to you today, are you hungry? Are you hungry? Not hungry for Chick-fil-A or Bunions or Soul or Cracker Barrel or Taco Bell. For some reason, there's like now a Taco Bell every 10 feet on, in Florence, Alabama. Like, not for food. Are you hungry for something deeper than your stomach? Are you hungry spiritually? Are you hungry for prayers to be answered in your life? Are you hungry for generational strongholds to be broken in your family? Are you hungry to see habitual sin and strongholds and addictions broken in your life? Are you hungry to see seasons change from one season, a dry season, into a more fruitful season of your life or your family? Are you hungry for a move of God inside of your spirit, man? Are you hungry for a move of God inside your family, inside your house? Are you hungry for a move of God in God's church? Are you hungry for a move of God in this community? It's going to take more than just popping up another restaurant. Because you know in Florence, Alabama, no one cooks their own food, nor do they wash their own cars. It hasn't satisfied anybody yet. New restaurant hasn't satisfied. There's a hunger that's deep inside. And my desire, my prayer is that that hunger will be stirred in you in this next month. And if you're not hungry, you can actually create hunger. If you're not hungry for the things of God, say you're lukewarm or you're, you're, you're a seeker, you're, you're just, I don't know what I think about God, I don't know what I think about this church, and, and you're not hungry, you're just kind of going through the motions, you can actually create a hunger. Like if you're not hungry right now for food, and you just do without food for a day or two days, you'll create a hunger in you. In the same way, if you create a hunger by fasting and separating yourself from things for a while, it will create a spiritual hunger in you that can be the, the catalyst to change your entire life. Are you hungry? If you would, stand to your feet as we read Daniel chapter 10 together. It says this in verse... Two of chapter 10. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks, meaning he was mourning, he was fasting for three weeks. Three whole weeks, 21 days, Daniel said, I was not doing it. I was mourning, I was grieving. I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for the full three weeks, meaning for 21 days, he ate nothing but fruits and vegetables. We call this a Daniel fast. It means he ate fruits and vegetables. He became vegan for 21 days. Fasting is different. Some people go with just juice. Some people go with just water. Some people go with just fruits and vegetables. Some people, it's all types of things. But he says, for 21 days, I sacrificed some things in order to pursue God. He says, on the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Euphas around his waist. His body was like barrel, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the, flame, and the, flaming tor and the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great trembling fell upon them, and they fled to hide themselves. So I was left alone and saw this great vision, and no strength was left in me. It's amazing how the one person who's praying and fasting sees the vision, the other people don't. The other people experienced the presence of this messenger of God or this angel, but they didn't get to see the angel. They didn't get to hear the message. Only the one who had prepared themselves through prayer and fasting saw it. So I was left alone. My radiant appearance 
was fearfully changed, and I retained no strength. Then I heard the sound of his words, and as I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in deep sleep with my face to the ground. And behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And here's what the messenger from God said. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly loved. Meaning God is always going to start whatever he's going to share with you through the lens of relationship. And usually the first thing God's going to do before he speaks to you is confirm his love for you. And the first thing he told Daniel in this season of sacrifice and humility and laying there with no food, nothing for 21 days was, Daniel, I've come from heaven to tell you, God loves you. He loves you. He's satisfied with you. He's fa you're favored in his eyes. And some of you, that'd be the greatest message you ever heard. That God so loved the world that he gave his son for you. And he's pleased with you. And everything you do, everything you pursue comes out of this place of knowing God's love for you based on Jesus, not on what you've done or what you've not done. He said, man, greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you. Stand upright, for now I have been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. Then he said to me, fear not, Daniel. For from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard and I've come because of your words. Meaning the very first day he prayed, he had some requests. We know that his request was understanding of the times that he was living in as a leader of Israel in captivity. You have some prayer, some request, something you need to know from God something that you want to ask of him, something you need from him to do, a breakthrough in some era of your life. And right here, Daniel says, he lifted it up, and the angel says, the moment, the moment you lifted up your voice, the moment you prayed, God heard you. Some, some of y'all need to hear this. You have never, I don't care how deep and dark you were when you prayed it, you have never prayed a prayer God has not heard. I'll say it this way. You've never prayed a prayer God has not answered. He says in the scripture, the moment you prayed it, God heard it and God answered it. He said, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. It's amazing how the battle was going on the same amount of time he was praying and fasting. For 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief priests, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia and came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision is four days yet to come. It's amazing. God answered his prayer, but it took 21 days for the answered prayer to get from God's mouth to Daniel's ears. And the reason it took 21 days and not one day or two days or a week or two weeks is there was a battle raging between Daniel's ears and God's mouth. And the angels were trying to get from point A to point B, but there's a whole lot of opposition. Meaning the angels knew that if Daniel got the answer to prayer he was looking for, it would change everything. And maybe you have not received the answer to prayer because there's a battle raging on your behalf, but you're not participating in the battle. You prayed it, and then you left. Daniel prayed it, and then he began to prayer and fast to put himself in a position and situation to engage in the battle to help the answer get to him. God answered the prayer the first day. 21 days of war raged, keeping him from hearing what God wanted him to hear. At the end of his fast, the battle was over, and the battle was won, and he got the answer he was looking for and had the breakthrough that he was praying for. Father, we love you. And we thank you that you are a God of breakthrough. That, Father, when we come against obstacles and opposition, Father, when we come against hard places in life, we know that you are a God who can move all things. You can move mountains. You can break through. And right now, Father, I just pray that you encourage every person in this room. You encourage their minds, their hearts, and their spirits to engage in the battle of breakthrough. Father, help move them to a position of prayer and fasting. Help them crucify their flesh so they can feed their spirits and be stronger from the inside out. Father, open up our minds, our hearts, and our spirits to who you are and what you say about us in Jesus' name and all God's people said. Amen. You may be seated. God answered his prayer, but there was a delay on him receiving it. 
He filled the space between him praying and receiving, not with vanity, but with prayer and fasting. And prayer and fasting, fasting is simply this. It's, it's refraining from food or refraining from something you want, fleshly, to focus on something spiritually. Whether it's answered prayer, whether it's to hear God's voice, whether that's a breakthrough, whether it's healing sick, of sickness and disease, whatever it may be, you're saying, I'm not going to do this because I want to focus on this. For Daniel, he's saying, I'm not going to eat any of the king's meat. I'm just going to eat fruits and vegetables for 21 days so I can focus on hearing God's voice. For some people, maybe I'm cutting off electronics, the TV, social media, for whatever time length it is. The Bible talks about three days, fast, 10 day, 21 day, 40 day, whatever it is you pick, I'm going to stop doing this so I can focus and seek God in that time I was going to do the other things. Fasting many times is the key to the breakthrough you're looking for and whatever you're looking for. We see in the Bible, almost every single person, every single person we see we claim as a hero of the faith or we see with breakthrough, almost every single one of them experienced their breakthrough at the end or on the other side of a season of prayer and fasting. We want things just to happen to us and for us. People in the Bible realize if God is going to move, I have to position myself in a place and in a way that he's going to move in and through my life. In fasting, many times you look at the Bible, Moses prayed and fasted before he received the law and received the Ten Commandments. David prayed and fasted in a season of knowing which way to go and what to do. Nehemiah prayed and fasted before he started the vision for re rebuilding the city. Ezra prayed and fasted before they moved forward in, in life. Esther prayed and fasted before she went and saw the king. Isaiah prayed and fasted before he delivered God's word. Daniel prayed and fasted before he started his journey. Joel, Jesus prayed and fasted before he started ministry. The apostles, you can keep going. There's a pattern that when you need to experience breakthrough in your life, prayer and fasting is usually what precedes it. So I don't know about you, but if I'm needing breakthrough in my family, in my life, in my ministry, in my church, in my finances, in my body, and I see there's a pattern, I'm going to start with where the pattern starts, and that's with prayer and fasting. It's basically saying, I'm going to get away. Here's what one author said. Fasting is voluntarily going without food or any other regularly enjoyed good gift from God for the sake of some spiritual purpose. It is markedly countercultural in our consumerist society, like abstaining from sex until marriage. I mean, I'm abstaining for something, for something better. And fasting is saying, I'm abstaining from this because there's something better. I mean, I want to feed my faith, so I'm going to starve my flesh. So you have to realize this. That most of us, we live life without ever thinking about who we truly are as people. And when you were created by God, you were not created just as one entity. You were created as three parts as a person. Body, soul, and spirit. God reached down in the dirt and, dust and, and pulled dust together and formed Adam in the image of God. He created the body of Adam, the, the vessel, the, the outer shell of Adam. Then he breathed his spirit into Adam. When he breathed his spirit into Adam, now the soul was created because the soul was like the capsule of the spirit. So now you have body, soul, and spirit. You have three parts to you. Most of us only ever think about one, maybe two. And to understand the power that is inside of you, you have to understand all three. See, the body is like the shell. It's the outer part of you. It's the worldly conscious. It, it, it picks up things through its senses, sight, hearing, smell, touch. It's always wanting what's outside of it. It's always wanting these things out here. The soul is inside of it. The soul is the self-conscious. That's your emotions, your attitude, your personality, your feelings. Inside of your soul is your spirit. So your soul is self-conscious. It's all about self and me, 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 my, my, my. But the spirit is the God-conscious part of you. That's the part that wants to please God. That's the part that wants to honor God. That's the part that wants to, to be righteous and holy. It, it's God, it thinks about what God wants, what God desires. And that's where the Holy Spirit lives inside of your spirit. That's where the fruit of the Spirit are. That's where the joy, the hope, the love, the power that you're looking for is inside of your spirit. Watch me, says every religion in the world is trying to tap into that spirit power, that power of the soul, as he called it. He called it the latent power of the soul. 
Meaning, if you break this outer layer, this, this body, this flesh, and you can tap into that soul, there's power in that soul. New age, they try to tap into the soul. You go to Huntsville, there's new age places all throughout Huntsville. You go to bookstores, there's new age books, there's gemstones and, and crystals and tarot cards and palm reading and all these things. And what they're trying to do is tap into the spirit or the power of the soul. They know there's power there for, for revelation. There's power there for, for knowledge. There's all types of power. But we as believers, we want to go a deeper layer. We want to get into the Spirit's power. Where the Spirit is, there's freedom. There's power. And it's eternal freedom, not just temporary. And in the Spirit's power, it takes more work to get there because it's a deeper layer. Watch me explains it like this. If you have an egg, an egg... We just call that one egg. But that egg has three parts. It has an outer shell. Then it has the egg white, whatever we call it. You know, I call it meringue pudding. <laughs> you got the white part. We call that the soul. And then the inside you have the yolk, which is the yellow. That would be the spirit. So the soul is just inside the body, but it encapsulates the spirit. And in order to really understand what needs to happen is, if you're going to feed your spirit, you have to start breaking off some layers to get there. If I want to make an egg omelet or scrambled eggs, I have to start busting this up to break it to get to what the good stuff is. Because the body, the shell, has no value at all. There's no nutrients in this shell. I was choking. When I was growing up, I pretty much raised myself and from the age of 12 to almost 15 years old, it was just me and my dad. My dad was always at work. So to eat, the only days we really ate was on Tuesdays. My grandmother would come over, help clean the house. My dad was a bachelor, and he, had, he was a single dad. She'd clean the house, and she'd cook dinner. Outside of Tuesdays, if I wanted to eat, I had to learn to cook for myself. And I learned a couple of things. One of the things I learned was on the bag of cornmeal, there are the directions to make cornbread. And directions are pretty simple. So I remember I started making cornbread because I wanted to, I was a really skinny, scrawny kid. And back then, the way to gain weight was uh, load up on carbohydrates. So I was looking at carbohydrates, cornbread, carbohydrates. So I started making cornbread. I knew how to follow directions. I did not know how to crack an egg. So all of my first couple batches of cornbread, you could taste a nice, good bite of cornbread and then crunch on eggshells. See, no one wants the eggshells in the good stuff because there's no value to the shell. See, your body, even though that's what everybody sees, that's pretty much what everybody else judges you by, it has actually no value. Your good looks will fade and pass away. Your nice muscles, RJ's starting to get a little six-pack. He's starting to compare. I was like, buddy, when I was your age, I had a six-pack too. Life happens. There's no value to it. it. It fades. When you die, the shell, they're going to take and throw away into the ground. There's no value to it. But that inner man, that spirit man, is surrounded by your soul. And just like when you're cracking an egg to get past that outer layer into the things that are valuable and important, the same way with the spirit. In order to tap into the valuable things of the spirit, you have to break the outer man. You have to break down the flesh so the spirit can rise up. Or some people say, this must decrease so that the spirit can increase. And the spirit, if I want freedom to increase, if I want hope to increase, I want peace to increase and joy to increase and love to increase. That means I have to decrease my flesh because those things will never be found in my flesh. They're only found in the spirit. And so I have to break down the outer layer to release the inner layer. And that's exactly what fasting does. It breaks down the flesh so the spirit can be released. It starves the flesh so that you can feed your spirit. And some of you have not fed your spirit in years. Some of you have never fed your spirit. You've been in church for years, but you never fed your spirit by spending time reading God's holy word. You never fed your spirit through seeking him through times of prayer. You never fed your spirit through fasting and through preparation. You've been feeding the outer man. You've been feeding your, the flesh, but your spirit is crying out, hungry and starving to be fed because once the spirit is released, everything you need for breakthrough is already in you. Everything. 
Everything God gave you Jesus for is already inside of you. When you were born again, every promise was fulfilled, as Scripture says, is, is yes and amen in Jesus. Meaning all the hope you need, all the power you need, all the love you need, all the joy you need, everything that the kingdom of heaven is, is already inside of you. You just can't see it because your flesh is distracting you. And when you break down this flesh through fasting, you'll finally start seeing what's inside of you and you'll begin to release it. And that's when you'll see breakthrough in your life. So a couple quick points on fasting. Before I even get started, fasting is this. For some of you, you got medical problems. You, if before you fast, you might want to check a doctor. Some of you, fasting may be your doctor. For some of you, fasting may be fasting one meal a day. For some of you, maybe fasting for the 21 days along with us. For some of you, maybe fasting meats. For some of you, maybe fasting caffeine or sweets. Whatever it is, pick something that cost you something, that is a sacrifice, put it aside for 21 days so you can seek God and let him feed your spirit. Because as you do, I promise you, you'll see dramatic changes in your walk with God. Number one, fasting is a weapon to crucify your flesh with. Fasting is a weapon. Touch your neighbor and say it's a weapon. It's a weapon to crucify your flesh with. Why is that important? Your flesh will not crucify itself. It has to be crucified. And the only way to crucify something that's fighting against you is to use a weapon to make sure you win the fight. What happens is once you get saved, this battle ensues. Galatians, I'll read to you. Galatians 5 says this, but I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh for the desires of the flesh are against, everybody say against, are against the spirit. It means the desires of the shell are against the desires of the yoke. The desires of your body, your flesh, are against the desires of your spirit. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other. They are opposed to one another to keep you from doing the things you really want to do. Meaning you want to serve God. You want to love Jesus. You want to be set free. You want to have joy. You want to have hope. But your flesh says, no, your flesh will talk to you. Your flesh will speak to you many times louder than God's spirit will. And you've learned to listen and obey the voice of your flesh. You don't think so? If, you drive, if you're a caffeine person, you drive past Starbucks, I promise you something starts saying, just pull on in. If you drive past Bunyan's, I promise you your flesh will start talking to you. It talks, it says, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me. Your flesh speaks to you. And you've learned to obey your flesh more than your spirit. And the scripture says they're against each other. If you're serving your flesh, you're opposing your spirit. And the problem is before you were saved, they were in agreement with one another. You had a dead spirit that was submitted to your flesh. Whatever your flesh wanted, your spirit was like, cool. Whatever your flesh wanted to do, your spirit was like, I'm good with that too. Then you get saved and Jesus kicks out your old dead spirit, gives you a new spirit. This spirit is not cool with the things your flesh wants to do. This spirit wants to glorify God. This spirit wants to serve God. This spirit wants to serve the kingdom of God. And your flesh wants to keep on serving itself. It's more worried about the world and getting what the world has, while your spirit's more worried about the kingdom and what the kingdom has. Now they're fighting. That's why so many people give up. Once they get saved, they get frustrated because it gets hard. Yes, you just started a war within yourself. Part of me wants to serve God. The other part wants to keep doing this. And this battle enrages because your flesh has the desires. And the desires are natural. Hunger is a very natural desire. Sex and sexuality, lust is a very natural desire. Greed is a very natural desire. Anger is a very natural. Do you realize everything we call a sin is probably a natural desire? We just choose to satisfy it in a way that's not under God's rule and authority. Every single sin you can think of, it's very natural. That's what people say, well, it's natural. Yes, it's your flesh. And God doesn't want you to live by the flesh. He wants you to live by your spirit. And so God gives us fasting as a way to train our flesh to shut its mouth. 
If you can train your body when it's hungry, say, listen, I know you're hungry, but I need you to shut your mouth because right now I'm focusing on God's voice. And you start training your flesh and your body to submit to the will of the Spirit. You're retraining your flesh to now come in alignment with God's will because you've been spending your entire life training your spirit to come in alignment with your flesh. And if you can train your flesh to submit to your spirit through fasting, then you can train your flesh to submit to your spirit in regards to lust, in regards to anger, in regards to greed, in regards to jealousy. You're training your flesh and you're teaching your flesh who's boss. And you do that through the weapon of choice, which is fasting. Old illustration is this old Cherokee chief had a young Indian, he came into him, and the chief starts telling this story. He said, inside of me, there's two wolves. One wolf just really wants to do what's right. He wants to do good. He wants to do what he's supposed to do. And da, da, da. He said, but I have this other wolf inside of me who just wants to do wrong. He wants to do evil. He wants to do exactly the opposite. And the young Indian boy said, wow, so what's the battle like? He starts talking about how he wants to do right, but he always does wrong. And this and this. And this. He said, which wolf wins the war? The chief says, whichever one you feed the most. Some of you are losing the battle inside of you because you feed your flesh more than you feed your spirit. And if you begin to feed your spirit, your flesh will begin to die off. And our job in life as disciples of Jesus is to learn to walk by the spirit, not by the flesh. Number two, fasting is a hammer that breaks down strongholds in your life. So it's a weapon to crucify your flesh, but it's also a hammer that breaks down strongholds in your life. A stronghold is a pattern. It's a protected pattern. It's as simple as that. Meaning it's something you've been doing for a long time, but now you protect it in the stronghold. Stronghold is like a castle or a safe or a wall. Meaning it could be a way you think that you say, you know what, this can never change. If it can never change, it means it's protected. Well, my mama dealt with this. My daddy dealt with this. Or they were poor. I'll always be poor. That's a stronghold. I'll always be addicted. No one's ever set free. I was once an alcoholic. I've always been an alcoholic. That's a stronghold. Anything you say God cannot do, that's a stronghold. Anything you say God cannot change, that's a stronghold. Meaning it's a pattern of thinking that you're protecting and defending away from God's breakthrough power. That's what a stronghold is. Here's what he says in the word of God. Isaiah 58, 6 says, is not this the fast that I choose? I mean, he's talking about fasting again. To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every single yoke. God is saying fasting helps break down the strongholds or the, the barriers in your life. Addiction, that's a stronghold. Fasting can help knock that thing down. Addiction, deliverance, break it down. Patterns of thinking, break it down. Lust, break it down. All these things. Fasting is a hammer we use. The problem is that we don't want to partner with God. We want God to just do all the work. Meaning, if I have a stronghold, I want to come down the altar, have Benny Hinn wave his magic coat over me, and everything be good again. We want to come down the altar, have somebody pray for us. You know, I've been dealing with lust for 45 years, or I've been dealing with addiction 25 years, and we just want them to lay hands on us and everything be good. Again, your flesh will not crucify itself. And this here says the fast he chooses is the one that breaks down the yoke. Know, sometimes that hammer is a jackhammer or a wrecking ball. It comes through in your life and just breaks something quickly. It can tear down years of strongholds in a moment. But most of the time I've learned that God doesn't come through like a, how about I said like a wrecking ball and I just had a Miley Cyrus thought. <laughs> he doesn't come in like a wrecking ball. He comes in like a little chisel. And he gives you a hammer of discipline or a hammer of fasting and he starts letting you chisel away at strongholds in your life, little by little. Minor victory after minor victory. Grace upon grace. Over and over. See, many times, especially in Pentecostal churches, I think we think of the power of God as this rushing, mighty thing. But sometimes the power of God is perseverance and endurance. To run a marathon rather than a sprint. And for some of you, you got things going on in your life that are strongholds. You've tried a lot of things to break. Maybe it's time you choose the hammer God chooses, which is fasting, and start breaking that thing off 
little by little by little by little and see God set you free. Number three, fasting is a medicine that heals my body. Fasting is a medicine that heals your body. Why? God knows your body better than anybody else knows it. Like he literally created every little thing. It's amazing, people that I know in the medical field, especially people that used to be atheists, once they get in the medical field, they're no longer atheists because they realize this is not by chance. This is created by somebody who knew exactly what they were doing. God knows exactly what's going on in your body right now. He knows every nerve, every tissue, every organ, every cell. He knows it all. He knows exactly how it should be. And he created it perfectly. In the Garden of Eden, there was no sickness nor disease. But through the fall, and sin enters in, now our bodies are distorted. But Jesus came to realign and restore everything that was lost at the Garden of Eden. That includes our bodies. He knows your body, and many times we're sick and we're diseased because our bodies are out of alignment. There's things in our bodies God doesn't want there. There's things our bodies are doing that God didn't intend our bodies to do. And many times fasting helps reset our bodies back to the way God wanted them to be. So much so, doctors are now prescribing fasting as a way to cure diseases. There's a documentary on Netflix called uh, Forks Over Knives. They take this incredible case study. They had numerous people who were terminally ill with heart disease six months until they died. Heart disease, not a minor thing, heart disease, terminally ill. They brought them in, put them on a 21-day juice fast. Most of them were cured and healed. They then put them on a diet that was no meat, only organic fruits and vegetables. This is like the 80s, early 90s. At the time of the documentary, just a couple years ago, all of the people in the case study who were given six months to live were still living 20 plus years later except for two and they died of natural causes. Meaning fasting has been known to cure diabetes. It's been known to cure certain cancers because it resets your body back to its original state. It gets all the junk out. It unpollutes your body and helps your body become one again. That's why when you fast, if you drink caffeine like I do, about day three, you're going to have a headache from the pits of hell. You don't want to see anybody. You don't look at anybody. The kids, Dad, I love you. I don't love you. Just leave me alone. God, I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to talk to anybody. But after day three, your headache goes away. You know what that headache's from? You've had so much caffeine in your brain that it's begin to, beginning to purge out the last bits of caffeine. After that's over, your brain is replenished and restored. We've seen situations with lungs, people smoking, they stop smoking, their lungs heal themselves. Your body will heal itself if you let it. And fasting is one of the ways, fat, cancers of all things. You look at cysts and, and uh, tumors, that kind of thing. If you know what they are, it, it's not a new epidemic. Tumors and cysts are nothing more than the body growing too fast in certain parts. They're unhealthy cells growing faster than they should be growing. Because if they weren't growing so fast, the body would naturally take care of them. But since we live in a world where we worship our stomachs, we feed our bodies things that are feeding ourselves things. We are what we eat. If you're eating steroid-filled Chick-fil-A, if you're eating all these creatine, amino acid, and fueled foods, you're taking them, putting them in their body, and then what's happening? Cells that should not be growing are growing faster than they should be. That's why the cancer rate in developed countries like America and Europe are twice, almost twice as much as undeveloped countries like Haiti and Africa. That should tell us something. That in Haiti, I have half the chance of getting cancer as I do in America. Why? We're eating ourselves sick. And we love it. We love it. There's a new restaurant in town. Let's go eat it again. Is, we eat ourselves sick and God says, well, let's stop this pattern. Let's stop this pattern. Let's reset the body the natural way. Instead of adding more chemicals into it, instead of adding, let's just take 21 days, let's purge our bodies of all the junk and let them reset themselves naturally. Your taste buds will change. At the end of 21 days, every year, I, I love sweet tea. And at the end of 21 days, the first thing I want is I want sweet tea and coffee. I'll take sweet tea and I'll drink it. Out. <laughs> what is this? What kind of, and it's so sweet. I'm like, they ruined my sweet tea. It is not them, it's me. My taste buds have changed. 
We train our taste, but then I want coffee so badly. And then you get coffee and you're like, what is, and I look at coffee as liquid Holy Ghost. And I'm thinking, I don't even like the Holy Ghost anymore. Like what's, see, because your body's changing. God is taking your body. Do you realize you're not intended to eat a bunch of sweets? You're intended to eat the things God gives you, which are natural. And when you fast, you reset it, and you can see healing properties in your body. If you need a healing in your body, I cannot strongly encourage you enough. Try fasting for 21 days. Go to your doctor and say, I want to stop my medicine. I want to try to fast for 21 days. I talked to a guy at the adopt a block. He told me his wife had cancer. They diagnosed her with cancer at the, at the emergency room. They went to the doctor. They said, we want to do this. He said, let us just fast for 21 days. They'd been vegan before. They'd stopped being vegan. He said, let us fast for 21 days. Fasted for 21 days, went back, cancer was gone. Like, I encourage you, if you are dealing with cancer, diabetes, diseases, sickness, go to your doctor and say, can we just get off the medicine for 21 days? Because I want to see what God can do when I reset my body. I promise you, there is testimony after testimony. Number four, fasting is a decontaminant from the stresses and distractors in life. Meaning it gets rid of all the distracting things in your life so you can focus on the things that are important. When you look at your life, I don't know about you, but I can't go anywhere without having a notification on a phone, on a computer, at home. There's all these things. Social media. I've gotten off social media for the past couple of weeks, and it is life-changing. Like, I can focus for the first time in years. Like, we have so many things our flesh wants. We want to be entertained. It wants to be all these things. And your spirit just says, I want to sit still for a minute. So your spirit just wants to be still in the presence of God. Your spirit wants to just rest so it can receive everything God wants, and then it can release it. But your flesh wants to be occupied. Like your flesh wants to be entertained. Your flesh wants all these things. And when you fast, you say, whoa, I'm going to stop these distractions so I can focus on God in an undistracted format. There's an old book on fasting. It talks about all the stimulants in our lives. And it goes through, and it breaks them down in order, like narcotics and alcohol and tobacco and caffeine. And it goes into meats and fried foods, and then it gets into produce, it gets into fruits, and then it gets into juices, and then water. And their explanation is when you fast, you eliminate all the other stimulants in your life except for one, the Spirit of God. So if I can remove all the other stimulants and just have the Spirit of God as the only stimulant left in me, I'm more likely to hear and respond to the voice of God than any other time in my life. Number five, fasting is many times a key to break through or a key to open unanswered prayers in your life. We see this with Daniel. The prayer is answered, but it was fasting that got the prayer from heaven to earth. Jesus shows up and the disciples are just trying to cast out a demon out of this person and they couldn't do it. And all the townspeople were upset. You know, they said they could do it and they couldn't do it. And da, 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 da. Jesus comes up, he puts his hand on him, says, I rebuke you in the name of da, 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 and the demons flee. And the disciples after is like, Jesus, how'd you do that? We tried it and couldn't do it. He said, well, this one comes out by nothing but prayer and fasting. They tried the prayer part, but they hadn't tried the prayer and fasting part. See, many times key, the key to your breakthrough is not just prayer, it's prayer and fasting. And some of you have tried the prayer part You've tried the church part, you've tried the worship part, but you haven't connected it with fasting. Maybe it's fasting that is the key that finally lets you receive that answered prayer you're looking for. Maybe it's that, that key that unlocks the season you're in to get you into a new season. Maybe it's the key to breakthrough in whatever you're dealing with. In your, maybe it's the breakthrough to your, your marriage because here's the deal. Everything you see and everything around you Every problem you have, your job, your marriage, your family, your, your house, your finances, everything has a spiritual, invisible precedent. Meaning everything visible started in the spiritual realm. And we get so caught up because we're fleshly people in trying to deal with the symptoms that we see. We deal with the symptoms of our marriage. We deal with the symptoms of our finance. We deal with the symptoms of our sin. We deal with the symptoms, but there's a spiritual, invisible precedent or root cause to the problem. 
And if you just deal with the symptom, just like any other sickness, if you deal with the symptom, it's going to come back around and cycle back through. So when you're going through a cycle or a pattern, you need a breakthrough. And a breakthrough is this. When I get a key to unlock the spiritual cause for what I'm going through physically. Because sometimes your marriage problems aren't a marriage problem, they're a spiritual problem. Sometimes your healing, your physical problem isn't a physical problem, it's a spiritual problem. And when you get into prayer, there's been many times, I've gone through seasons of prayer and fasting, I'm praying for, kind of like Daniel, one particular thing. Looking for God to answer that, and I go through a season of prayer and fasting, and at some point during that season, God will show me something different. And what he's showing me is the spiritual cause of whatever I was praying about. Meaning I was looking at a symptom and God gives me the root cause of it. Meaning I was seeing the symptoms, God's showing me the spiritual cancer. So once I see it, then I can unlock it by applying myself to deal with whatever he showed me. Some of you, listen, 2020 is going to be exactly the same. I don't care how much you party on New Year's Eve. I don't care how many resolutions you make on December 31st. You know and I know it's going to be exactly the same. Your sin patterns are going to be exactly the same. Your marriage problems are going to be exactly the same. Your financial problems will be exactly the same unless you break the spiritual root of it. And you do that through prayer and fasting. If you would, bow your heads and close your eyes just for a moment. My prayer... Like I, like I was thinking about this Friday. Like I, I'm not a preacher. Like I'm not even a pastor. I know people that get into ministry because it's a job. This is not a job for me. I didn't move my family from Nashville, Tennessee to Florence, Alabama to have a job. I came here to be used by God to create a movement of God that changed a region. And like I'm hungry for that. I'm hungry for a move of God in my kids. Alicia's 16, about to be 17, going to enter junior year school. I have one year left for my oldest daughter. I'm hungry to see God move in her life. I'm hungry to see God move in people's lives at our church that I see week in and week out dealing with the same exact problems. Like, I'm hungry. And then I'm hungry. I want to have the hunger I had when I first got saved. I want that same fervor, that same hunger. Like, I'm hungry. And the only way I know to really recreate that hunger and to stir that hunger is to create hunger through fasting. And some of you in this room, between you and me, you know and I know you are not hungry for the things of God. You are lukewarm at best. And you need to go through a season of prayer and fasting to spark hunger because your flesh is winning the battle. Some of you, you need to re-stir that hunger you had years ago when you were on fire, forgot hungry for his word, couldn't wait to open up the Bible and read his word, couldn't wait to pray, and now it's kind of maybe dessert. You need to go through prayer and fasting to re-stir that hunger you once had. Some of you, God has wanted to use you. God's wanted to break through some things in your life, and he's going to use seasons of prayer and fasting as a catalyst to start something in the spiritual realm that then will break through into the physical. It's time to start breaking the shell and let the power of the Holy Spirit come in and through us. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you in this place that you are a God of breakthrough. Father, we are praying, we are expecting breakthrough in families, in marriages, Father, in bodies for healing over sickness, disease, and cancer. Father, we're believing and expecting for breakthrough in finances and people in this place. Father, we're believing for a breakthrough in businesses and business owners in this place. Father, we're praying for breakthrough in the spiritual realm in this place over strongholds and generational patterns. Father, we're praying for breakthrough in teenagers who have succumbed to the world to break through and be the people you've called them to be. Father, we're praying for breakthrough in kids that are back in chapel. Kids, they can experience something that their parents never experienced. They experience freedom from a young age and keep and maintain that seed of freedom for their entire lives. Father, we're praying for a breakthrough in this church. That you'll break through our fleshly desires. You'll break through our personal agendas. You'll break through what we want and you'll satisfy our souls. 
and you'll move in and through us as a people. Father, pray for breakthrough in West Florence. We're praying for breakthrough in Haiti. We're praying for breakthrough in Florence City Schools. We're praying for breakthrough in and through this. We're praying for breakthrough in the Dream Center. We're praying for breakthrough in poverty. We're praying for breakthrough in addiction. Father, we're praying for breakthrough. We're believing that as we humble ourselves, we sacrifice our fleshly desires. You'll fuel, you'll feed our spiritual desires. So Father, I pray for hunger to rise up in every heart in this place. Father, I pray for the, the next 21 so days that people have never prayed will experience the presence of God like they've never experienced the presence of God before. Father, I'm praying through these prayer meetings that people will experience your word. they become alive and fresh. Father, I'm praying that you rekindle hearts. I'm praying that you start the fire upon the altar again. Father, we bless you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would, stand to your feet all over the room. We're going to go back. One more song of worship real quick. If I have the altar team come down front, they're going to be down front. If you need prayer for anything, I, I told first services, I believe how you end one season will determine how you'll enter the next season. And my pastor taught me that. I, I believe that through and through. How you close one chapter will determine how the next chapter begins. If you don't believe me, read a book. They close the chapter out, then they start the next chapter, leaving off where the last one stopped. We're going to end 2019 in this last song of worship. And for some of you, it's time to seek God's face, to agree in prayer for something. Maybe you're looking forward to in, in the 21 days of prayer and fasting. Some of you, it's just a, an attitude of worship. Some of you, this song is just to be a prayer. Like many times, worship songs are our prayer. We're praying to God through this song. But let this be kind of the closing of one thing so you can open another.